But you, Jimmy asked me what I was, uh, the scriptures I was going to share. And one of the ones is from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. You don't have to turn there right now. Where Paul says, I has not seen, ear has not heard. And I'm going to say, well, Paul said it, neither hath it entered into the heart of the man what God has prepared for those who love him. He is quoting Isaiah, but he changes one word where Isaiah says, those that wait for the Lord. And when Paul says, eye has not seen and ear has not heard, he is not referring to heaven. He is referring to the things that God has prepared for you individually. They already have your name on them. They are waiting for you to come to the place in your heart where you are able to receive them. There are many things today that we cannot receive because of our earthly affections. And unless we have been changed from one glory to another glory to another glory, uh, we will not be able to see or receive what the Lord has already prepared for us. Jeremiah said, or actually the Lord said through Jeremiah, I know the thoughts that I am thinking towards you. And then he says something very strange. He says, they are thoughts of peace and not of evil. Why would the Lord have to tell us that his thoughts towards us are thoughts of peace and not of evil? Well, remember that the Israelites ascribed to him evil intentions. Have you brought us out into this wilderness to kill us? No, I brought you out here to make you more alive than you, will, you could ever imagine. But because of your present heart condition, you will think evil of me. And the expectations that I have for you will never be fulfilled. I, I was so blessed. I, I haven't heard that song, Jesus Paid It All. I can't remember the last time I heard that song, but the, the time that I remember it the most, I was saved, I was in the world as far as business, not in my heart, and I was making a lot of money, but there was no satisfaction in my heart. The Lord had touched me in such a powerful way that he cut me off from this world. I, wanted no, I had no aspirations to become anything, to own anything and the like. He had put in my heart, and I didn't even know it was there. Do you know when you are born of the Spirit of God, you, you, have, you are born of an incorruptible seed or a seed that is is in, uh, filled with incorruption. And when that seed begins to blossom in you and take root, your corruption puts on incorruption. And the death in you is swallowed up in victory by that incorruptible seed. And when you are born again, God puts into you Christ in you, the hope of glory. And that is one of the three most powerful forces that man can experience. There is faith, hope, and love. And love will take you through things what nothing, I mean, hope will take you through things that nothing else will. It will become an anchor to your soul. And so I was going to lunch a couple days in the same place and a blind man came into the restaurant and he was tapping his cane and there would be spittle coming down his face at different times and I wish I could whistle it but I can't but he began to whistle Jesus paid it all 
All to him I owe. You talk about the Lord using the weak things of the world and the foolish things of the world. And that man was used by the Lord to convict my heart and say, what doest thou here? And it haunted me. And just like we said, I, I will never be the same. I ended up in a meeting and a man began to preach the word of God. How long hold ye between two opinions? If Baal be God, serve him. But if God be God, serve him. And as he was preaching the word, he did what every good preacher should do or what every good preacher should hold. He brought the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ before me and before the congregation. And in that light, we see how we have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Remember that there was no light shining out of the tables of stone when Moses came down off the mount. The light was upon his face, and it was that light that went in and searched the hearts of the people. And they said, we do not want you searching our hearts. Put a veil upon your face. And when we see the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, he reveals to us, he uncovers to us how we have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that is the first step in being changed from one glory to another glory. As John says, if we see him, we shall become like him, for we shall see him not as we think he is, not as we imagine him to be, but we shall see him as he is. And when that man was preaching that word, and so often when the Lord is doing something in your heart, Everybody else disappears. There's nothing going on in you except what the Lord is doing in your heart. And David prayed this prayer. He said, why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Do you know it's not always hallelujah and hosanna, is it, Pastor? You sometimes have to go through hell to get where God wants to take you. And as that man preached that word, and even as David was praying, send forth thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me, and then I will go to the altar of God. Now, wh where is the altar of God? What is the altar of God? How can I put an offering upon the altar of God if I do not know what it is? And the altar of God, the first offering that was ever made on that offering, and it's referred to as the golden altar in the book of Revelation, the first offering on that altar was Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God slain from before the foundation of the world. All other truth is based upon that truth. Paul said it this way, no other foundation can any man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And the reason that he is the foundation is because there is only one spirit. There is only one Lord. There is only one faith. And it all began whenever God in his heart, <clears throat> if you want to say that, said, I'm going to so love the world that I have not yet created. And he had the answer for sin before man ever sinned. He said, I am going to so love the world that I am going to give my only begotten son so that whosoever receives him might be saved, might not perish, might come into a glory where he can become, behold, the love with which the Father hath loved us, that we should be called the sons of God. You and I have an opportunity to be changed 
from one glory into another glory, even into that same image that we are beholding. And how can I preach the glory of the Lord if I have not seen it? You look in the book of Isaiah and you have 66 chapters of nothing but the glory of the Lord, the glory of the Lord, the glory of the Lord. And the reason you have that is whenever the Lord came and convicted Isaiah's heart, that he agreed with what the Lord was saying, he justified God in his sayings, and what God said of Isaiah to begin with was this, you are a man of unclean lips. And Isaiah justified God in his sayings, and whenever Isaiah justified God, God justified Isaiah, and he says, I've cleansed your lips, and now, now Isaiah, you are on the path of the just. When you were born of the Spirit of God, your feet were put on the path of the just. And it is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto a day of being perfected. And at the end of that light, there is a light unto which no man can approach. In fact, none of us in ourselves have anything, can do anything, to go towards that light, and David knew it. That's why he said, send forth thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me, and then I will go to the altar of God. And when that light begins shining in our heart, it's going to stir us up to uh, build an altar in our heart and put upon that altar something of our natural life. And as that man was speaking, the, the Spirit of the Lord began in me to work, and he began to build an altar. Now, the golden altar in the... And, and so I'm going to say some things. I cannot explain them to you. I'm just going to declare it to you, and the Lord will have to reveal whether or not I'm telling you the truth. The altar in the book of Revelation, John saw in the Spirit. Gold doesn't have much value up in heaven or in spiritual realms. It has its value here. Do you understand what I'm talking about? There's, there's treasures and riches uh, of the wisdom, of the knowledge, of the glory of God hid in Jesus Christ that so far past gold that, uh, just like Paul said, it's like dung. Okay, and when he talks about the altar and when it says that Jesus is the Lamb of God slain, from before the foundation of the world, he is talking about the spirit in which the Father offered Jesus. And when Jesus came, Hebrews tells us this, that he offered himself through the eternal spirit. And the only way that we can put an offering on that golden altar in the book of Revelation, and the Lord wants us to put all of ourselves on that altar, is in that same spirit. That's why Paul says in the book of Revelation, if that same spirit that raised up Christ from the dead dwell in you, it will make alive your mortal body. And what will it do? It will cause you to become a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, because you are now offering yourself in the same spirit that the Father offered Jesus and that Jesus offered himself and that every man and woman who has lived from the time Adam was created that pleased God did so with that same spirit. The law made nothing perfect. It came, it had a purpose, but it was not what God intended even from the beginning. That's why John says, and all of the writers in the New Testament in some way always take us back to the beginning. It's always good to know where we started. And John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And nothing that has been made was made without Him. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And in 1 Corinthians chapter, 
chapter 2, where Paul says, well, right before that, Paul says this. He says, you see your calling, brethren, not many wise, not many mighty, not many noble after the flesh are called. But of him are you in Christ Jesus. If you can walk in Jesus, live in Christ, walk in the Spirit, he will enable you to do things you could not do if you had a thousand years. One touch from the Lord and he could do in you what you could never do. Even. That's why one day with the Lord is as a thousand years. The day he touched me and saved me, I couldn't have done it for 10,000 years. But the power and the glory and the mercy and the long suffering of God came in here and he touched me. And oh, the joy <laughs> that floods my soul. So this man is preaching the word and the, that eternal spirit gets into my heart. That same spirit that raised up Christ from the dead, and it made alive my mortal body. It quickened my mortal body. And I put upon that altar my beautiful home. Put upon that altar my future. I put upon that altar four children from the age of five down. <laughs> my wife was already on the altar, and we sold our house, and we went to Bible school not knowing where we were going. And when we did that, our eye had not seen, our ear had not heard. I couldn't begin to tell you the things that I am telling you today because I did not know they exist. I had not seen them. I had not walked on the path of the just. But the Lord had sent forth his light and they began to lead me. And as I, as I was walking, the Lord's word was to me, a lamp. Now, a lamp doesn't give a lot of light. It only gives so much light, maybe for a few steps, and then everything else is outer darkness. And as I'm walking in that light, just as David said, the Lord will enlighten my darkness. So as you walk with the Lord, as you are obedient to him, as you justify him, as you agree with him in his sayings, you then will continue to progress on the path of the just or the justified. So that when Paul says in Romans 5, being justified by faith, now faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And you might say, well, I believe God because the preacher was preaching and he said the sinner's prayer. And I came and I repented and there was tears and there was a great change in my heart and I was sorry for my sins. That's wonderful. And that's very necessary. But that's only the beginning. And your eye has not seen, your ear has not heard what the fullness of the Lord is towards you. And he is so full towards you that no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. The problem is that the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him. He's not talking about someone who is unsaved, although that applies. But he is talking about believers there who, when the Lord sends forth his light and his truth, that we may be in a place in our heart where we hate the light and we do not want to receive the truth, even as it happened with Paul the Apostle in Romans 7, 9, whenever Paul says, I was alive without the commandment. But when the commandment came, sin revived, where? In me, and I died. He didn't die physically, he died to his relationship with the Lord. Now listen to what he says here. He says, and the commandment that caused death in me, the commandment was ordained unto life, but I, I responded to it with my natural thinking, he says, and I found it to be unto death. Now, what happens here is of great importance in your walk with the Lord. 
Remember in Hebrews it says, let us go on to perfection. Well, the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto a perfect day. Let us go on to perfection. And when I first read this, when I was first saved, I said, this doesn't make any sense. And this is what we do if God permit. And I thought, well, why would God not permit us to go on to perfection? Because spiritual progress depends upon our responding to the Lord when he sends forth that light. And when he sends it forth in our life, it can bring us to a place where we have to make a very, very, very difficult decision. And that decision, if we look at it in the natural, will appear to be to us nothing but loss and death. Then the things of the Spirit of God, they are foolishness unto us. So Paul says, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, but we hear the call. You see your calling, brethren, not many wise, not many mighty, but of him are you in Christ Jesus, who, what a statement this is. Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto you, made unto me, wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and to the extent that we allow him to be our wisdom and our, right, or his, our righteousness and sanctification, to that extent he becomes our redemption. To that extent we recover that which is was lost in our life. Do you know there are things that you were born without and some things you were born with that are the result of generations past as far back as you go? And the only way that they are going to be redeemed is by the Spirit of God. You get a revelation of the heart of God for you in this. Whenever Isaiah said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Now this is the heart of God. This is the reason for the anointing. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. It is in the heart of God, if you have a broken heart, that he would come, and he doesn't come with lumberjack hands. He comes with hands that have had nails put through them. And when he binds up your broken heart, he does it with such gentleness, such patience, such long suffering. And when he starts, you're thinking, I'll never, ever, ever want to live again. I'll never, ever be happy again. And on it goes. And he begins to work. And he begins to work. And one day he touches you and it's healed. And you think, well, glory to God, that's the end. And then... A little later on, you say to him, thank you, Lord, that you allowed me to have a broken heart. It's one of the best things that ever happened to me. Do you know why? Because when your heart is broken, it's the way of the Lord putting things in proper order in your heart. And he does not just justify us. He glorifies us. He just does not redeem us but he glorifies us. He puts his glory upon us. And when he does that, people do not recognize, who is this that cometh up out of the wilderness leaning upon their beloved? So the Lord will send the command, and, and unless we justify him in his sayings, we're not going to go on. No matter how much we sing and dance and shout, no matter how much we preach, no matter how much we read our Bible, no matter how much we pray, unless we justify the Lord in his sayings, we're not going on. David said it this way, Lord, you do not delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices. Your delight is in a broken heart and a contrite spirit. What is that? That is you coming down in your heart. Now, when that happens, 
And only when that happens, you get into the Lord. Come unto me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And as long as you're up there with Peter shouting, though all deny thee, I will not deny thee, you're not going to get too far. The Lord has to bring you down and break your heart and bring you into a weakness that you did not know existed within you. He can bring you to a weakness where you utterly faint and fall. And what a blessed and wonderful place to come to because that's where you get eagle's wings put on you and you in yourself do not have the materials or the knowledge as to how to make eagle's wings. But the Spirit of the Lord can put them on you instantaneously and you go from total weakness unto total strength. And as the old time Pentecostals used to say, it is better felt than telt. And, when you, and David says, whenever he was in difficulties, he says, when, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Now get this, please. For thou has been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. You have been my rock. You have been my deliverer. You have been for me. Jesus Christ was made for David. Did you know that Jesus was David's Lord? The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou here at my right hand. He's talking about Jesus. Why? Because Jesus was the Lamb of God slain from before the foundation of the world. So that the Spirit of Christ was in the Old Testament prophets. When Job cried out, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That was the spirit of Christ talking in him, not Job. The spirit of Christ prophesied in them. The spirit of Christ caused the psalmist to pray, deal bountifully with me, O Lord, that I might live or I might come into your eternal life. And he was praying what the rich young ruler was praying when he came running unto Jesus. What must I do to have what you have? And the psalmist said, deal bountifully with me, not that I might get a big car, who, you know, or a new house or whatever. Deal bountifully with me that I might have in me what you have in you. For in him are hid all the treasures of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. And I thank thee, Father, that thou hide them from the wise and the prudent, but you reveal them to this person who's all broken. The world despises, and the Lord comes, and he says to the Samaritan woman, I am the Messiah. He didn't go around telling everybody. And the only person in the New Testament that he told directly that he was the Son of God, others discerned it, but the only one that he told directly was the man who begged for over 30 years that the, the Lord touched. And the, you know why? Because that touch in that blind man and all that he had to suffer gave him the heart condition to be able to receive that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God, and he said that he worshiped. Now, the commandment of the Lord came unto Jonah. Jonah was on the path of the just. He was walking on the path of life. And the, the word of the Lord came to him instead of all the other prophets that the Lord had on the earth and in Israel at that time. Why would the Lord tell a prophet that he knew wasn't going to do it, to do it? Why would the Lord tell you to do a command that he knows you're not going to do? Well, he's going to do that so that he reveals in us how we have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Our sin is not, it is, but it's not what the Lord's dealing with. Uh, it's getting drunk, adultery, and those things. Our sin, 
that the Bible is speaking about when he says we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God is our unlikeness to the Lord who is full of grace and of truth and we are a lie and he has to change us from the lie into the truth. So he, he so loves Jonah and he loved Jonah. Uh, he comes and he says now, and Jonah's praying in his morning devotions. Lord, where do you want me to go? I'm so ready to preach your word. Do you want me to go to the tribe of Judah? Do you want me to go to the tribe of Benjamin? And the Lord says, go to that great city, Nineveh. And Jonah's heart, the hatred rose up in it because the Ninevites were the coolest people perhaps who ever lived. And he said, I will never do that. And it took the Lord quite a bit to convince him to do it, but God never won Jonah's soul. He would say to him, doest thou well to be angry? Doest thou well to be unlike me? And Jonah hardened his heart. He heard the Lord's voice. Today, if you hear my voice, he hardened his heart. And he said, I do very well to be unlike you. I do very well to be angry. I am the righteous one. Those people do not deserve mercy and grace. And you know how that all played out. And do you know how the book of Jonah ends? With a question. And I don't know whether Jonah ever answered it. And because of that, the book of Jonah ends. And he doesn't continue on the path of the justified because he did not justify the Lord in his saying. Are you getting what I'm saying today? If you don't, that's okay. Because sometimes the Lord will sow the word in your heart and you might not only not understand it, you might despise it. But that's all right. Because the Lord works in you first to will. Now, if he has to work in you to will, that means you're unwilling. <laughs> and then after he works in you to will, you end up doing. And you say, after a period of time, what a change in my heart. I not only am doing what the Lord has told me to do, I am delighting in doing your will, O oh God. Can you imagine? He takes us from where we're unwilling to where we delight to do thy will, O oh God. I don't know if you've ever heard me give a testimony of how the Lord told me to go and hug my mother. And uh, that was the wisdom of God to me. We, we were... We had great desolation in our family, and I had great desolation in my heart. And after I got saved, and I, I have so much I'd like to share with you. I'd like to be your point taste. But uh, the Lord, we were in Bible school. Oh, and I think, oh, now I'm on the path of glory. And the Lord comes and says, as she's standing about where Jimmy is for me, uh, go hug your mother, and my hands hung down, and my knees became full. I was so sick inside, I could not hug the woman who, who loved me up to that point by giving me my meals every day, washing my clothes, and on and on and on, because of pride and other s sinful things. And I, I can't go into all of the things that happened that day. What a glorious day. And I finally did it. <laughs> and... From that point on, it came to the place, just like the psalmist said, after he prayed, deal bountifully, a few verses later, he says this, I will run the way of your commandment after you have enlarged my heart, after I have become a partaker of the divine nature. When you become a partaker of the divine nature, when the love of God is shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost, not emotion, it's not emotion, it's spirit, and the love of God is shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost, you will run the way of the Lord's commandment. But the beginning of that is, by faith we have access into this grace wherein we, we stand, and what are we doing? We are rejoicing in hope, of the glory of God. It's in here, and, and, and it's making us alive, and it's enabling us to glory in tribulation. 
And while we are glorying in tribulation, we become patient. We learn, <clears throat> not only learn, but we wait upon the Lord. And in his time and in his way, he comes to the place where our heart is enlarged and we come into an experience in him and we can say, thou hast been, we, we went from faith and, and not sight, we can now say, thou hast been a shelter for me <clears throat> and a strong tower from the enemy. Now my eye seeth thee. <clears throat> and it's not that Job never saw the Lord before. He never saw him in the glory that he saw him in when he got down this far on the path of the just. He had seen the Lord many times or he never would have gotten to the place where he was the perfect man on the earth. That's, that's the only way it could be. So the Lord will come to you and it's a very personal, it's a wonderful thing for him to tell you to do something that he knows you're not going to do. So I am in Bible school again and go to chapel and I don't know what they were singing. It might have been, I'll go where you want me to go. Dear Lord, I'll say what you want me to say. Tears running down oh, my heart. I, how I love the Lord. Well, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And he comes and he taps me on the shoulder and said, I so appreciate your dedication and commitment to me. Do you remember what you did before you were saved? No, I had done a lot of things. <laughs> but I knew exactly what he was talking about. I cannot tell you how. Well, yes, I can. It haunted me. I was saved. I was serving the Lord, but there was this nagging thing going on in me. Go make it right. Go make it right. And he said to me, do you remember that? I said, oh, yeah, I'm trying to forget it. I'm, I'm pushing it down as far as I can, but you're not letting me. <laughs> He says, go make it right. The command, he didn't say, please go make it right. He said, go make it right. Why? Because I wasn't taking another step on the path of the just until I justified him in his sayings. And had I not responded to him, that's just where I would have ended up, just like Jonah stopped. He came to an end. I don't know whether he ever went on. <clears throat> I said, I'm never, ever going to do that. I viewed that in the natural, and I said, if I go and confess what I did, my life is over. I, I can't I, go back into the world. The Lord's ruined me for that. And when they find out what I did, I'm done. Okay. So that's it. I died. Sin revived, and I died. I did not know then that the commandment was ordained unto life. I don't know how long it passed. There's no praising the Lord whenever you are not doing a commandment. He's telling you to do. And I would go to class. I didn't hear anything the teachers were saying. I was dead in trespasses and sins, even though I, you probably don't understand this. I, I was born again, saved and all of that. But the Lord wanted to do something that had to be done in me. I don't know how long I was in that state. It was weeks. Miserable. Uh, anyway, finally it came to the place in my heart where I said, I've got to do it. I don't have any choice. If I perish, I perish. And that's how it stood. I said, I can't stay. I can't live like this anymore. So I determined in my heart to go where the Lord was telling me to go and to do what he telling me to do. And when I came to the wronged parties and I confessed my sin, I was just waiting for all hell to break loose against me. And do you know that the presence and the grace of God came into that room and swallowed up every bit of my sin in victory and he put it away, and it's in the sea of his forgetfulness. And that person who did that thing is no more alive. I am dead with Christ, and therefore I am alive with Christ.
And so he wants to bring you to the place where <clears throat> you are changed in here. And he says to you, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord, for the joy of the Lord is preceded by righteousness and peace. And it is, the joy of the Lord is a, a part of your very being. And I, I guess I'm going to run out of time. Uh, how much time do I have left here? I, I would do want to share one more thing with you if possible, okay. Oh, there's a clock, I have six minutes. We don't have those modern conveniences in America. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I want to share something with you. A scribe in the kingdom of God is like a householder who brings forth out of his house treasures new and old. So that as long as you are walking with the Lord, you are always discovering greater treasures that are in Jesus. You are always partaking of the greater redemption of the Lord. And the anointing of the Lord, when, when that spirit is received, Isaiah says, it will uh, repair the desolations, the former desolations, the desolations of many generations. And when I obeyed the Lord to uh, go and hug my mother, that was the beginning of a healing process in our family and it went on and on and on to where one day, 20 years later, my mother was in the same reverse circumstances as I was. And she looked up at me with this very strange look on her face. And she and my father had been through a lot of heartache because of the people in our family who did not receive the Lord. And she, I, said, I thought, what is she? And she walked over to me. And she wrapped her arms around me, and she looked up at me, and she said, I am so proud of you. And I said, Mom, it's not me you're proud of. I didn't say that to her. I said it in here. I said, if it weren't for the grace of God, I would have brought shame to you, just like the others did in the family. And all that glory, you are worthy, Lord. You are worthy of all praise. To God be the glory. Now I want to, and this might seem a little out of context, but that's okay. Maybe I needed to share it for, for me. I became a pastor, and one of the men who was very instrumental in having me become the pastor of this particular church went to high school with me. And he was saved about the same time, had a wonderful, marvelous conversion. The Lord saved his marriage, which was, was destroyed. And he had many testimonies, was used to bless many, many people. And we had such rich fellowship for many years in the church. Blessed times together, the moving of the Spirit. And, and somehow there was this separation between us. One of the greatest things the Spirit of the Lord does is he, re, he restores broken relationships. And how, how much potential is there in just one relationship? How much joy, how much peace, how, how much blessing? The father of the prodigal son, when that relationship was restored, he says, now I can take what is in me and put it into this son of mine that I wanted to do all the, all the time that he was born. So as time passed by, the split became greater and greater and greater. And eventually, we agreed to disagree. And he left the church, but he did not leave my heart. Do you know what I'm talking about? And I didn't leave his heart. Sometimes there are just things, I guess we don't yield to the Lord. Our hearts are not soft enough or whatever. Many, many years passed. Every so often I would get together with him, but there was no connection. Back in April, I got a call. This brother was in what we call hospice care in the United States. That's when you come to the last few weeks of your life 
and you are oftentimes in a coma or they're giving you pain medication that you don't know what's going on. And when I heard that he was in hospice care, my heart said to the Lord, Lord, don't let him die before I get an opportunity to see him. And I, I knew where his son lived. And his family, of course, was very upset with me over what had happened. And by the way, I'm not condemning him. I'm not justifying myself. I'm trying to point out a principle in the Lord where he comes that we might have life and that more abundantly. So I knew where his son lived and whether or not they were going to reject me, I don't know, but I was going to try to at least see him. When I got to the son's office, before I could get to the door, he came out with a smile on his face and he had such a welcome for me that I, I had to admit I was overwhelmed by it. And we began to talk. And he says, come into the office. And he asked me to share my testimony. And we spoke of the things of the Spirit of God for over an hour. And I said, can I see your father? He says, yes. He says, but I want to warn you. He says, he may not understand anything that you have to say. You may not understand anything he has to say. In fact, he may not even be awake when you get there. I said, that's okay. I just want to see him. And uh, so I got to the house and he was, he has a beautiful house. He was a very successful man. And he was laying in, in the hospital bed in his living room. They had taken out all of the furniture. He was laying on his side and he was staring out into space. His neck <clears throat> looked like it was six or eight inches long because of all of the weight that he has lost. His son told me he was down to 118 pounds. And when I walked over to where he was, you could see the bone. He had his pajamas on, but you could see this bone here sticking up. There was no flesh. He had skin, of course, but there was no fat on it. So he was staring out into space. And I went and I stood by the bed. And everyone else went out of the room. And he was staring. He was gray. Uh, he hadn't been sh hadn't shaved for a while. Just looking out. And he turned because he sensed somebody was there. And when he turned and he saw me, this is, do you know when the redemption of the Lord comes, the spirit is there to bear witness to it. Jesus is there because he sees the travail of his soul and he is satisfied. And your heart and, and anyone else's heart who is re, in, uh, part of that redemption. They are filled with joy unspeakable and full of glory. And the communion of the Lord is there. Our fellowship is in the spirit. When that man turned, and I had not seen him for a long time, and saw me, his face lit up. That same spirit that raised up Christ from the dead quickened or made alive his mortal body and he he got a uh, a joy on his face a smile on his face and i was amazed and thankful to the lord and i began to tell him what a blessing he had been in my life and in other people's lives and how i loved him and how i appreciated him and how my heart was broken over, over the different things that happened. And I said to him, I said, I would like to give you a hug. And he, and he was so fragile that I was afraid of hurting him. And, and he had no strength at all. And I put my arm around him and gently pulled him to myself. Do you know what a hug is supposed to do? A hug is supposed to bring you into me and me into you and fulfill Jesus' prayer that they may be one, Father, as we are one. Me and you, you and me, I and them and the like. And so I pulled him. The amazing thing is that he reached, he reached behind my back. I don't know where he got the strength. And he pulled me to himself. And after a while, I, we unlocked and he began to read, he, he tried to, he wanted to bring me to himself like this. 
well, somebody said, did you talk to him about repenting? I didn't talk to him about repenting. I wanted to tell him how much I loved him and how grateful I was for the blessing of the Lord. Whatever he lacked or didn't lack, that would be taken care of at the judgment seat of Christ. And I'm going to be there right after he is. And what we did will, will remain if it was done with that same spirit that the Lord was offered as the Lamb of God before the foundation of the world. Well, my time is up. And I've given you, as one man said in the States, I've given you a lot of broken bread. And I hope that it helps you not to faint in the way. What way? The way everlasting, the path of the just, which is a shining light, because there's going to come a place in your time and walk where you run out of strength, you have maybe no emotional feeling, there's dryness in your heart, but they that wait upon the Lord, they always get what they need to go on. And no matter how far you get, there's always more light, there's always more treasures, there's always more revelation of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor Jimmy, would you like to come? It was... Can, can I give you one more brief thing? <laughs> uh, there were two compliments I received uh, in preaching, and the one was recently where I was speaking for about 10 minutes, and a couple was sitting over here, and they got up and walked out. Uh, you may not understand how that could be a compliment, <laughs> but it is. Another one was this. After I got finished speaking, an individual came up, and they said, I hope that you're not insulted. But as you were speaking, it was as if you disappeared, and all I could see was Jesus. And I said, this insulted. I said, would to God that every time I spoke, I disappeared, and all you could see was Jesus. I hope that was the case today. May the Lord greatly bless you and lead you on.